Good morning, ICC family, near and far. We'd like to welcome you to our live stream. And um, we'd like to open this time with a word of prayer. But before that, I'm reminded of the song we used to sing when we were in Uganda. Almost every Sunday, we sing, we are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again in one accord. Something good is about to happen. Something good is in store. We are together again, just praising the Lord. And that's what we all aspire to do this morning. Amen? So let's just ask the Lord to come as we praise Him. Father, we just want to thank you for the privilege, the opportunity we have to gather again in your name. We do not take for granted, oh God. It is a privilege. And we ask that you will come in a special way as we worship you, as we praise you, as we exalt your name. Come, Lord Jesus, take your place. Lord, and may your presence bring joy, bring freedom, bring healing. May your presence set hearts free, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, we want to commit this time into your hand and ask for your anointing to rest upon Sam, our worship leader, Prince and Joe, on the music, and God, that you will minister to us as we minister to you with praise and worship. We bring a sacrifice of praise this morning, and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Good morning, ICC friends, ICC family, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's always a privilege, like Lillian said, to be in the house and the presence of God. It's a privilege to wake up every morning to brand new mercies and love and, and, and health. So these are things that we shouldn't take for granted. And when we come into the presence of God to sing praises and to worship him, in prayer, we should do it wholeheartedly. So I encourage you this morning, wherever you are, in your homes, at work, or wherever, just to, um, just to worship God in spirit and in truth, okay? Thank you. And I would like to start, I would just like to read a scripture of encouragement to you this morning. Um, it's from the book of Psalms, 100, 1 to 5, and it's the NIV version. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gate with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Give thanks to him and praise him for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. We have a faithful God, and it's a privilege to worship him. Hallelujah. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that can never satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing no turning. I've been set free
Hallelujah. This is such a blessed day that the Lord has made. Everything begins and ends with God. And so will COVID-19. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I want to encourage you as you listen to this song this morning, entitled No Longer Slaves. We need to learn to stand on the promises and on the words of God. We are no longer slaves. Whatever is holding you down, be it depression, be it sin, be it loneliness, be it addiction, nothing is holding you down. Hallelujah, because we have a God who has bought it us, everything for us. He's paid it all. Hallelujah. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Worship with me this morning. I'm no longer a slave to fear, cause I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. 
I am a child of God From my mother's womb You have chosen me Oh, and love was called my name And I've been born again Into a family Your blood flows through my veins I know, I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Proclaim it I'm no longer a slave to fear Cause I am a child of God Hallelujah 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Claim your freedom in Jesus' name. And I am surrounded ha, by the arms of the Father. And I am surrounded.
Cause I am a child of God. Do you know your identity? I'm no longer a slave to fear. Cause I am a child of God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Father Jesus, we thank you this morning, God, for the freedom that we have in you, Father God. Thank you for sending your son, God, to take it all. He didn't just take some of it, Father. He took everything, Father God. And because of that, we call ourselves free. We are not slaves this morning, Father God. And no matter what curses that has been, put on us by the devil, whatever thoughts the devil puts in our head, Father God, we should go back to your word that tells us that we are special, we are wonderful and beautifully made, and fearfully made, God, in your image. Father God, I pray for anyone who is out there who is struggling with identity crisis, Father God. I ask you to call them back, Father. Call the sheep back, Father God, to the flock. Jesus, you are the God who never leaves no one behind, Father. Even if one of your sheep God goes astray. You call, you go, and you bring us back. I pray that you bring us back this morning. And for those who don't know who you are, Father God, I pray that you reveal yourself to them in a way that only you can, Father God. That only you can, God. Only you can convict, Father God. I thank you. And I pray that we that call ourselves Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, that we will live a life full of example, Father, a life that really encourages other people that are lost to come into your kingdom, Father, that makes them want to ask and say, what is the secret? And we can say it's Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Thank you, Father.
poet's love so undeniable I I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you go you Jesus hallelujah thank you for your presence thank you God hallelujah God bless you thank you Jesus thank you Sam and the worship team thank you God thank you God thank you God this morning I just feel I need to ask you this question ICC family near and far who is your father. God is asking you this morning, who is your father? Who is your father? A father speaks of authority. A father speaks of a person who brings protection. A father provides. A father brings security. A father sets boundaries. A father provides shelter. A father provides love and acceptance. And I believe this morning there are some of you here, perhaps you grew up without a father. And you, you, you have walked through life with a lot of insecurity. This COVID-19 brings a lot of fear and insecurity in people. But perhaps there are deeper issues God has God is saying to you this morning, who is your father? Your earthly father may have failed you, but who is your father? Who is my father? I lost my father when I was 15, very abruptly. He went to work, collapsed and died. But thank God, six months before that, I became a Christian. And God has been my father in the absence of an earthly father. He wasn't irresponsible. He dropped dead. But God has been there. And I want to assure you this morning, God is your father. Make God your father. He's the one who is able to protect you. There's so much that a man or a husband or a spouse or an uncle or a brother can provide for you. Or even your pastor cannot do that for you. I promise you. But God is our father. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will always protect you. Amen. He will always look out for you. He will always provide for you. You will always have enough. Your earthly father may have failed that provision, but God will never. He will always, you will always be secure in his arms. He will guide you. He will set the boundaries that you never have in your life. God is your father. Shall we say that together? God is my father. Again, 
God is my Father. And one more time, God is my Father. Amen. And I pray that you meditate on that. Thank you so much. Thank you for the worship, and I believe the Spirit of God is here. You may be seated. ICC family who are here. And we'd like to thank God for this um, period, uncomfortable, unusual, but uh, a lot of good things have happened. A lot of sad things have happened to us privately too. Both my son have lost their friend during this COVID-19 very suddenly. Um, we have lost a family friend during this COVID-19 very suddenly, very sad. We are not able to go for the funeral. But it's been a, a reflective time, I would say. A reflective time. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But let our faith and hope be in God Almighty because when all the music fades, when everything is taken away, some lost their job, some businesses. We know of friends who have businesses and during this time they are stripped to nothing, you know. Um, and and it's, it's a reflective time. I believe it's a time of purification. And, uh, but we who know our God, let's look to Him, our Father. Amen? And trust Him to continue to provide for us. And we are very thankful to God during this time uh, for the last two months. Yeah, we have been able to do our service online. Um, and we are thankful for a crew. Ravi, myself, and Uf, we are the staff. And, and, and Uf, we thank you. Thank you. Uf has a lot of this thing you see here was never here. And Uf has somehow miraculously, with the wisdom of God, able to go into the incredible boundaries and help us to live stream. And thank, we are thankful to God because a lot of churches are not able to meet and they are scrambling around. And Uf actually helped other churches. He was a consultant during this time. Yes, to help other churches to be able to go online so that they can continue to minister to their members. So we thank God for that. But we also have three volunteers who are not staff. And uh, we have um, Michael, Prince and Josiah who have been here with us throughout every Every week. I know there was Sam who came and the board members who came and Ayomi all the way in Japan who helped us online. We are so thankful. But today we just want to acknowledge them. Maybe I will invite Ravi to come. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Lillian is my wife, so there's no social distancing. <laughs> uh, in case you're wondering why are you not social distancing from her, just, I mean, you never know. People will put this on the online and say, hey, they're not social distancing. I can't because she's in my same house. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, like Lillian mentioned, we want to thank many people, every single board member. Today, Sam, for the first time, Lillian preached for us. Uh, Victoria preached for us, Andy preached for us, and different ones. But there are three very outstanding young men who have been very, very uh, going out of their way, coming every single Sunday. Uh, from the very, very first Sunday, Michael uh, contacted me and he says, do you need any help with sound? And I said, of course, that would be very nice uh, if you could help me. And uh, likewise, uh, Prince and Joe, uh, as a matter of fact, haven't been asked that uh, you should come and help. They just said, you know, we're going to be there. Uh, to, to help you. And I even told them you don't have to come if you don't want to. Uh, there were many times Josiah had to come here first and then go off to work. Uh, and many times he had work. He's supposed to work. He actually gave up his job in order to be here. And that's also very admirable. Um, and, I, and it was the same rules I applied to the boys. I said, when you're here, you know, it's, you've got to follow the rules and the regulations. We're not going to beg you. Uh, if you have to leave, you, of course you can leave. So it was very strict. Uh, <laughs> and I thank God for that. But today, because we have started, for those of you who are following us online, um, we have actually been allowed uh, in Denmark to have a regulated, spaced out um, meeting with live people. So you may not see them, but behind the camera, I tried to pan during the praise and worship. Yeah. We have uh, less than 30 people in this uh, group, I think, who are all scattered uh, in different locations with all the right uh, social distancing and health hygiene uh, uh, rules taken into consideration. So we thank God for that. Today, I want to also take a little moment to just, before this uh, crowd that is here, acknowledge three men. We have a little gift, a symbolic gift, just to say that we are so thankful for their um, services. And so I'm going to call them out one by one because they can't come all at the same time uh, so that they will not be able to infect each other. But starting with, <laughs> with Michael, if you can please be so kind to come forward, we want to ask you, please give him a hand. Here's a little symbolic gift for... 
for your sacrifice every, every Sunday. There you go. Please give him a hand. <laughs> and also, we want to thank uh, Prince. If you can be so kind, you've been uh, volunteering literally every Sunday. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Josiah, if you can let go of the camera and jump around. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. And uh, Lillian, I will give you your gift when we go home. <laughs> you get, you get a big, you'll get a big hug from me. <laughs> No, but uh, thank you to those who have actually been very, very, very kind and helpful. And I really appreciate uh, others who have been here, from Sam to um, uh, Lillian and Victoria and, and Andy and... Um, who? Who was it? Oh, Sandra, sorry. Oh, yes, of course, Sandra, I'm sorry. <laughs> And they are so much in like, you know, they are a couple, husband and wife, so I, I barely notice the, the difference. The two shall be one. And Sandra says, I am the one. <laughs> yes, 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 we praise God for that. And uh, I'm going to share with you a message this morning uh, entitled, uh, The Evolution of Salvation, after which we will go into a time of prayer. Thank you also, Sam, for leading us in praise and worship. It was so nice to be able to worship. And also, I think for Sam, it's nice to have some live people besides those of you who are on screen. We love you too. And by the way, for those of you who are in uh, ICC, just for you to know that uh, ever since we put up the ICC's uh, uh, group, we have a Facebook group, the numbers has been increasing gradually. And to date, uh, this morning, I think we were above 1,600 uh, followers from around the world. I'm, I mean, not everybody's online like on the same time, but it's just amazing that we have that opportunity to reach out to that many people through a little congregation like ICC. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Amen? So we thank God for that opportunity, and um, to God be the glory for that. This morning, I would like to share with you a message which is entitled, The Evolution of Salvation. And so if you could just join me in a word of prayer, and uh, we will go right into the Word immediately after that, starting with the text, which is from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 15. For those of you who are here in ICC, the Scriptures are obviously uh, on the PowerPoint, and for those of you following from home, you can obviously join us with the passages. Let's pray. Help us once again this morning, Lord, to be able to speak your Word. Father, as you and I were having a conversation this morning concerning these service, I pray poured out my heart to you, and I told you, Lord, that I can't say anything without your strength, without your help, because you said that your word comes down from heaven like water, and it waters this place, and it'll never go back to your void, and I thank you that your word has power for transformation, for changing lives. Words of human, and the words of philosophy, and the words of man is useless in a time like this. We need your word, Lord. We need your voice. So, Lord, I just ask again, as I did this morning, Come, please, and, and speak. Just use me as a vessel, as an instrument. Take away fear from my heart, the fear of man, and be, enable me to speak as the prophets of old would, declaring your word fear, fearlessly and boldly in order to understand that it is a very precious opportunity, a very precious obligation to, to share your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak in a mighty way into our hearts and our spirits. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Starting from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible says here, this is my text, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst declares Apostle Paul. Paul, obviously, prior to becoming a believer in Christ, has been a Pharisee and have done a lot of things that any Pharisee would do. It's a very Pharisaical way of following the Scriptures, and in the midst of it has also been a witness of murder 
That was one of the things that Paul was involved in. And he considered himself a chief sinner, very, very uh, well versed with the Word of God. And the title that I want to share with you this morning is Concerning Salvation, because he said Christ came to save all sinners, including himself. He considered himself as the chief sinner. And it's amazing because as we go to the Word, the title of the message is kind of, you know, ironical. It is the evolution of salvation. Let me first of all mention this to you. It's very important that you understand. I believe in the biblical declaration of creation and not the humanistic theory of evolution. All right? Call it science. Call me foolish. But I think the foolishness of God is still wiser than men. Hallelujah. All right. Now, it's just why I used that word evolution, you know, in a little inverted commas uh, to, to, to mention to you that the theory of evolution, by the way, it's a theory, still is a theory. Uh, don't let anybody make you think otherwise. The theory of evolution, it states that we all evolved from a single cell organism into this complex being. I mean, tell you honestly, it sure takes more faith, in my opinion, uh, to digest that than in the fact that an almighty God has kept us breathing through his borrowed breath uh, until he comes again and sorts out the mess that we created. <laughs> Amen? So I am a firm believer that uh, it is God who, who created man and it is not man who created God. Now, though the concept of evolution is a theory, I submit to you today that evolution of salvation is a fact due to the evidence I'm going to provide to you today because salvation has actually evolved over the years and unfortunately not progressing. As a matter of fact, regressing. And let me submit to you and explain why it is so. The word salvation means, biblically speaking, to be snatched out of fire or snatched away from impending danger into security, into safety, into sanctification or sanctity. Can you say amen to that? Oh, it's so nice to be able to hear amens. Hallelujah. I've been talking to a camera all these months, and when, and when I said, can you say amen, the camera just stares at me. You know, <laughs> I'm sure those of you at home are saying amen. But oh Lord have mercy. There is actual human beings here. I can't believe this. Glory be to God. I was telling Sam before she came, I said, uh, uh, can you lead in worship? She said, yeah, yeah, I'll be, because she actually asked me. By the way, it's only those who have asked me, can I help you? And I said, please come uh, and, and help. Uh, it's not because, you know, I uh, am very picky or choosy. So I'm uh, just watching during this period who is the one that comes forth. I said, I'm available. Can you use me? So that's awesome. And so I told her, I said, there's going to be live recording, and there's also going to be live people. So she said, oh, it's so funny the way you say it. There's going to be live people. It's actually, that's what they did in some churches because there's no live people. They put little dolls, you know, in the chair. I'm, I'm serious. They actually they put little dolls on the, chair, on the chair so that the preachers are motivated by preaching to the dolls. <laughs> I'm pretty sure all those dolls got saved by now. But in any case. Um, so, uh, therefore, the word salvation literally means to be, to, to have a, a, to, be sanct to be saved, to be sanctified, to be secure, to have a sanctity of your mind. Of course, it also begs the question. The question is, saved from what? If to be saved means saved from what? Sometimes you go to somebody and say, hey, uh, you, you need to be saved. And immediately they ask you, uh, from what? You know? And so um, there, there was like this Mexican guy uh, who went to, to uh, American guy who went to Mexico. And then he, he, he was, you know, he, he, he had a lot of friends. And he asked one of the guys uh, in, the, in, the, in the street, he said, hey, do you know Jesus? He, then, then the guy said, yeah, yeah, I do. Then he said, hey, Jesus, come. Because, you know, Jesus is a very common name in, <laughs> in Mexico. <laughs> Anyways, so to be saved, to save from what? Well, the truth is, the simple answer is to be saved from hell, created for the devil and his angels, and unfortunately also for those who do not believe in Christ. That's the simple answer to be saved from. Some people try to mix it. They try to, you know, um, sugarcoat it and make you kind of feel good because they don't like to mention this word. But that's the truth. That's what we're being saved, snatched out of the fire. Hallelujah. 
So the basic principle of salvation states that we are in danger of hell as sinners and we need repentance from a Savior. Amen. That's the basic principle. So now we've established salvation, saved from hell, we, we, we need a Savior. Now the question again arises, so who is this Savior? Is this Savior a religion? Is this Savior a person? Is this Savior some ingenuous human philosophy? Because we are amazing with that. Is this Savior nationalism? Is this Savior, because you know Israel was supposed to be a nation that was set aside from the rest, right? Is this Savior the planet? Is this Savior an economy? Is this Savior education? Is this Savior theology? Is this Savior denominationalism? Is this Savior health? I mean, we can go on and on and on. Save who is this Savior? It's very important. Because uh, sometimes we do not understand that. We tend to make very big mistakes. There's a man who made a statement. If I mention his name, you probably know. His name is Karl Marx. He's not very famous or anything to do with Christianity. But he made a religion one time. He said, religion is the opium of the people. That's how uh, communism was uh, uh, spread, because it's the opium, opium, it's a drug. Uh, I think it's quite an understated statement in our time and age. Why did he make such a statement? Why did that, that statement have such an impact? Is our salvation today some kind of a dopamine effect? You know what dopamine does, right? It's in the... It's this pleasure center of the, of the brain. It gives you this feel-good factor. Um, it, you know, that's what people go and whatever you, uh, you're addicted to, it gives you this pleasure, makes you feel good. I'm just wondering, is that what salvation is to some of us? Feel good. Is it the opium of the people? So, this is what I want to submit to you this morning. It's very interesting questions that we are asking. There are three dimensions to salvation. What are the three dimensions to salvation? First of all, I remember my son asked me one time this question, long, long time ago when he was a little bit smaller. He said, how do you get saved? And I said, oh, there are three, three ways uh, of being saved. He said, huh? How, how, what, what do you mean? I said, first of all, we are saved. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ and you confess that he is Lord, you are saved. I said, second of all, we are being saved. In other words, every single day, God is changing us uh, to getting better and better and better. Amen? I pray that each one of us, as we look back uh, on our own Christian life, we can say that we're actually getting better. How many of you can say that? Amen. Amen. If you can't say that, I'll pray for you. <laughs> That's what salvation is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you into the image of Christ. Amen? So we have been saved when we believe in Christ. We are being saved. That's what sanctification is. God is changing us. And then the final dimension of salvation is we will be saved. We will be saved means uh, when we meet him face to face, hallelujah, the incorruptible will put on, uh, the, the, the corruptible will put on incorruptible and then we'll be meeting him in the end. That'll be a wonderful, a joyful day. Amen. Glory be to God. So, but that is salvation. Uh, and, but uh, I also want to just share with you three thoughts about it, which I hope will be helpful before we close in a word of prayer. What we're going to do is that we want to look at uh, Judaism, you know, uh, the children of Israel, uh, in terms of their salvation then and now. Uh, what do they believe in salvation? We also want to take a look at Christianity, a history of Christianity in terms of salvation then. And now, trust me, this might take... In a normal class, if I was teaching in a Bible school, it'll take about 40 hours to, do, to cover this. But I'm just trying to give you a snapshot. So, so just bear with me. We won't be able to go into all the details. And last but not least, we want to look at the cry of Scriptures, how to return to Scriptures, which is very, very important. So we start <clears throat> with Judaism, then and now. Now, this is what Jesus quoted. What is the, you know, if you take all of Judaism and try to just crystallize it into one thought, what is that one thought? This is what Jesus said. He actually quoted from the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 concerning God uh, being one God. And in Mark chapter 11, uh, 12, verse 29, Mark 12, 29, this is what he said. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. He's one 
the Lord our God is one. Amen? Now, that is the, the, the crux. That's the crucifix of, uh, of, Christ, of in Judaism. They believed in one God, and that's what set them apart in the time and the age that they were in from all the rest of the world because everybody believed in uh, polytheism, which is many, many gods, and they believed in monotheism, one God. Now, of course, as foreigners or aliens, you can uh, believe also in this God through Judaism. You can become a convert to Judaism, but... This is through a very tedious process, including circumcision, by the way, for the men. So if you are an alien and you were joining Israel and you said, hey, I want to kind of believe in your God. Yeah, of course you can, but the process is pretty long. It's not easy. That entire process was actually called a born again process when you go through this process. It's a long, tedious process. And that's why when Jesus spoke to Rabbi Nicodemus, can you remember that conversation? Jesus told Rabbi Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the rabbi was like, Jesus, me, I'm a rabbi. I teach other people how to become Jews. How can I, how can I be born again unless I go back to my mother's womb because I'm already born a Jew? Some of these foreigners and aliens, they, they wish they were born a Jew. They couldn't. And, and they went through, by the way, quite a tedious process. Uh, if you wanted to become a Jew, as, let's take in the time of Jesus, for example. Uh, you came in as, a, as an alien or as a, as a, as a non-Jew, a proselyte. You want to become a, a, a Jew. So what happens is that, first of all, they bring you through the, the Tanakh which is basically the, the Torah, which is the law, the Nephim, which is the prophets, and then the, the, the Psalms. And you, you, you have many portions that you have to memorize. Can you imagine? Memorize the, the portions. Then after that, you will go through almost a couple, uh, um, like a year's you know, course where the rabbis will follow you and teach you and make sure that you're eating kosher and that you're following the rules and that you, you understand this. And finally, after all that process, they will test you. Keep on testing you with the scriptures to find out whether you really understand what's going on. Are you really, really understanding why it's important to be a Jew and be circumcised and all of it? And the last part of this uh, process is when you finally, they said, okay, you're really good, you've, you've, you're good enough. And then the, the rabbis will, will take you aside. There are four men that will come and cover you with a cloth to, to keep you kind of, uh, you know, private. And they will take off all the clothes and shave every hair. And when I say every hair, it means all hair, eyebrows, everything. They will shave you until you're literally hairless as a man. Right? And they will walk you covered like this into the river with this cloth. No hair, totally. And they, the rabbi will be standing in the bank and says, okay, dip him in the water. So you'll go down into the water until you're totally covered. And then one of the rabbis who are there covering you with the cloth, they will stick their hand into your mouth to make sure that your mouth is open while you're under the water so that your water is also going into your mouth. And then you will stand out of the water while water is pouring out of your mouth and, and you're totally you know, covered when you're naked. And the rabbi standing on the shore, he will point his finger and says, you are now born again. In other words, you've just become a Jew as if you came from your mother's womb water out of your mouth, totally. Not everybody is hairless when they come out of the mother's womb. I remember Prince and Josiah was full of hair when they came out. So I don't know how much born again they are. But anyways, but <laughs> um, the fact is, that was the process. So then finally, they says, now you are a Jew. Now you're ready. So the process to become a Jew, it was not easy. Even today, if you want to go to Israel or even here in Denmark or anywhere else, and you said, hey, you go to the synagogue, you said, okay, I'm a Dane or I'm a Nigerian or I'm a Ghanaian, I'm a Singaporean, I want to become, uh, you know, I want to become a Jew. And it's not easy. It's a tough process. They will, in fact, today's, according to the Jewish traditions, today, if you go to the synagogue and you say, I want to become a Jew, by tradition, the Jew three times is supposed to say no. You go to them and say, I want to be a Jew. They say, no. By tradition, three times they're supposed to refuse you. And you're supposed to come back three times begging, saying, please, 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 I want to be a Jew. Please, please. And then finally, after the third time, they said, okay, go talk to the rabbi. And then the rabbi will sit down. You go to a long list, explaining to you, do you know what it means to be a Jew? And almost trying to discourage you, telling you, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. Finally, you said, no, 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 please, I want, I want, I want, I want. They said, okay, fine. Now we have to follow you for almost a year. You have to learn the Torah, you have to learn the scriptures, you need to understand the, the, the rituals, you need to understand the law, the, the ceremonies, eating kosher, you can't just go out eating anyhow, and there'll be somebody spying on you. 
Hey, I was watching you. In fact, the rabbi will recommend that you move closer to where he lives. Talk about paying a price. Or closer to the synagogue. And you're supposed to volunteer in the synagogue so they can all watch you and observe your life. And they'll ask the people around you, when, is there, when he says he's doing that, is he eating properly? He'll follow you for a whole year. And after a whole year's process, they will bring you to test, bring you to the scriptures, make sure you understand everything. And finally, when you get to become a Jew, you'll be issued a certificate. This piece of paper is as good as an Israeli passport. Can you imagine? Some of you are getting ideas now, right? You're like, uh huh. <laughs> Not that easy. Not that easy. And so you ask, why? Why do they make it so difficult to get saved? You know, after all, even the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, even in times of Jesus, they traveled overseas to make converts. Jesus spoke about it. They went out and they did that. And Jesus said, woe unto you, Pharisees and Sadducees. You travel sea and land to make a convert, and you turn them twice the devil as you are. What a compliment, right? <laughs> why, why, why make it so difficult? Because they were very conscious about keeping the lineage of the Messiah. They understood that they were a nation that was set aside from other nations. It was through them the Messiah was coming. And this Messiah cannot be corrupted. And that's why they carry in their body the symbol of circumcision, which is a symbol of covenant. And so they understood that it is through this nation comes the Messiah. We have to keep our race pure. The Messiah is coming. We can't mess around, you see. Are you following? That was why. Of course, they don't realize that the Messiah is already here today, you know. He's already come. Now, so it was not easy, basically, to become a Jew. Now we come to uh, taking a look at salvation in Christianity. A look at Christianity and salvation then and now. In the early church, when you became a Christian, you paid a very heavy price. Please understand, the first Christians were Jews. They were Jewish. And they lived in a society that everybody treasured and, 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 and made sure that it's not easy to become a Jew. And then here you are, born a Jew, declaring a strange God. Can you understand? To them, it was a cult. There were a lot of cults in, in, in Judaism too. There was a lot of mysticism that was going on, Gnosticism and so on. It's, it's not unusual. And so when a Jew turns away from their own God and proclaims a man... Who, who says, eat my blood, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. You, you call this man your God. You were a cult. You, they, they called them away. It was a strange group. So that's why for those Christians, when, they, when the Jewish people, when they became a Christian, it was a heavy price that they had to pay. They were kicked away from their society. You couldn't go to the same groceries. You couldn't go to the same carpenter. You couldn't go to the same, uh, you know, I, I, Iron Smith. You, every, everybody looked at you and they're like, I don't want you. You go away. And so they had to form their own communities. By the way, the first Christian community wasn't a big, a very big community. In comparison, they were actually small in Israel, but heavily persecuted, very heavily persecuted. As a matter of fact, when the Jews, uh, when, the, when the Romans were looking for people to, 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 because the Romans didn't want any group that was a threat to them, political threat. So when, when somebody reports and says, oh, here the, the, some Christians, they don't, they don't worship uh, uh, Caesar. They don't bow down to Caesar. And they were taken and they were thrown into the lions or they were put on stakes and burned. The Jews were, they were happy. They rejoiced. So these early Christians, they had a heavy price to pay. It wasn't easy. In fact, what happened later on was in the progress of Christianity, I think the Dark Ages started when Constantinople said, okay, by this sign, you will conquer. Because con the Rome could see that these Christians, they were not giving up. You throw them to the lions, they said, I will die. You put them on the fire, they sing songs, sing hymns and, while they were dying. And so any commander, any, any, any army, any military will want soldiers like that. So what did he do, Constantinople? By this sign, he said, oh, I saw a cross, so by this sign, you shall conquer. He turned them all into Christians. And that was when the Roman Catholic Church started, unfortunately, beginning what we call the Dark Ages, in a time where paganism and Christianity was mingled together, and everything was watered down. And then we have this, the, the, the epitome of this bloodthirsty um, 
Dark Ages was the time of the Crusaders, if you remember that. I hope you don't remember, I wish I never remembered. <clears throat> it's one chapter of Christianity that I am very, very ashamed of what you can do in the name of God. That's the Dark Ages. Then came the Reformation. Martin Luther, can you remember? By the way, just before Martin Luther, but there were others who also tried to reform. They were easily quenched, but just Martin Luther became the most popular reformation. And he, of course, he came up with his biggest statement, salvation is by faith and faith alone. Can you all remember that? We're here today because uh, of the Protestantism against the Catholicism. Then you have this whole big argument after that. There's these two groups in salvation, in Christian salvation, the argument between the Calvinism and Arminism. Basically, Calvinism says that, oh, you know, when you're saved one time, yeah, you're always saved. Everything's okay. You're fine. But Arminism says, no, no, no. If you're saved, you still have to keep on working. Otherwise, if you don't keep working, you're going to lose your salvation. So there was huge splits. How many of you have ever heard about these two groups? Some of you. Okay? It's very important for you to understand because this is your history, my history. It's Christian history. So we've come from, from, from almost cannot be, be, be saved until this stage. And of course, <clears throat> during this time when uh, Calvinism was becoming popular around the world, they, they talked about justification in time, uh, justification by faith. It resulted in so much of carnality and so much of worldliness that the Reformation itself needed Reformation. <laughs> Does it make any sense? The time of the Reformation, it became so carnal, so worldly that... People say, we need to reform this. Everybody's becoming so carnal because once saved, always saved. I just get baptized as a baby. I can just go and do anything I want. It's okay. Seems like it was okay. That was salvation. Now, it was during this time that you have what we call the Quakers, the Anabaptists, the Methodists, and, and a whole bunch of other groups. They were very much preaching about sanctification. You must be saved. You've got to be holy. And that's also true. You can't go to this extreme and just be unholy. And true, we also need to get holy. But the problem was this. The problem was that when we moved away from there and we went to here, holiness eventually resulted in legalism. So legal to the point, and I'm not kidding, even till today, trust me, there are churches that believe if a woman cut your hair or you put on makeup, you're going straight to hell. Till today. I'm sorry, ladies. Have you cut your hair recently? <laughs> you, see, you see the other extreme. One is I can live like the devil and I'll still make it. Another one is like the moment I put on makeup, I'm going to go to hell. Can you see that? Where, where our salvation has, has so-called evolved, so, and what happens during this period of time? Enter the Pentecostals and the Charismatics. That was the time when the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement started. Hey, don't get me wrong, I'm a Charismatic myself. I come from, the, I was born again in the Charismatic Movement, so I'm not against them at all. But every one of them have their own little devils, as you will see, and you will understand what I mean. So, now the emphasis is signs and wonders. That became the flavor of the month. If you don't have signs and you don't have wonders, you better start sitting down and sighing and wondering because you're not in it. You're out of it. Now, I, 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 listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not against signs and wonders, okay? I've experienced them myself. But it's not only about signs and wonders. Paul was in Athens and he preached in, in chapter 17, Acts 17. There was no miracles, nothing. Paul, the guy who raised the dead, can you remember? Nothing happened. He just preached the gospel, and that's all was necessary. And then, of course, during this period of time, after the charismatic movement, then you have another movement called the Word of Faith movement. Very, very close to what the Paul was fighting in the early church called, called Gnosticism. Gnosticism is about mysticism. Mysticism means there is mind over matter. I can move things by just the things I say. Now, we believe that we need to have faith in God, but the extreme of word of, uh, word of faith is that they were having faith in faith. You see the difference? Massive difference, massive, and don't get me wrong. And then, of course, came along the prosperity movement. Prosperity movement is a very materialistic movement. Basically, it, 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 it somehow justified the most innate human desires, which is our, the lust of our eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Our faith was now suddenly measured by what car I drove, which house I lived in, how much salary I made, how big my house was. Are you following me? 
I'm just summarizing. Please, please, please follow me and, and, and understand. This is how our salvation has moved from being burned in the stakes to the size of my house. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> now, with those last, of course, uh, today where we are, you know, all this last has been taken care of. Today we are into another dimension. And now it's like, okay, I've got my last taken care of. You know, for, uh, salvation is pretty easy now. So we need some entertainment. I, I need to feel comfortable. So enter a new generation. It's called worship entertainment. Worship entertainment is let me make you feel good while you are good. And that's why I, I still struggle. Don't get me wrong. Go, I, I preach in, in different parts around the world, but I really, really struggle when I come out in a daylight where God created light. And then I enter into some churches where they darken the entire atmosphere and put all black curtains everywhere and put on fake lights and flashy lights and smoke screen so we can praise God. And we all have to jump and scream and shout into a frenzy before we actually feel. It almost feels like I'm in a club. In the club. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. But I look at the scriptures and I'm like, why do I need fake lights when I can have the real ones? Are you with me? I'm not talking about these recording lights, okay? <laughs> this is because I'm dark, so they make me brighter. <laughs> <laughs> Ulf was saying that, oh, we are doing recording live, we are doing recording, so we need to put some light now. And then uh, Ulf one day just fix up the lights and he turned it on while we still have these, you know, normal lights. And then uh, uh, Michael was telling me that uh, John had written to him, he said, why is Ravi, sh Ravi shiny today? And then I told Michael to tell, tell his dad that Ulf put on lights, that's why Ravi is shiny. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, the, but, 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 but just try to follow me where we are in salvation. Can you follow me? Are you following me where we are? You know, to, to this point. But what's worse now is not just you know, the fact that we need to be entertained while we're probably asleep, but from having a heavy price to pay for salvation, like it was in the early church, it is now reduced to just a few magical statements. And you're in the club, the feel-good club. Just come as you are. Just say this magical prayer, Jesus, forgive me. Yeah. Hallelujah, I'm in the club. And, but nothing has to be changed. There's no consequences, there's no follow-up, nothing, as long as you're in the club. Now, uh, it's, it's sad, it's sad. D -d -d Please hear my heart. If you misunderstand my words, just hear my heart. So now, what's worse is, we are working on altering the Word of God. That's where we are today in Christianity, brothers and sisters. We are altering the Word of God to suit our conscience and our imaginations of what God is. So, out with conviction, in with convenience. This is where we are in salvation. Who cares about conviction? Don't want to feel bad. I want to feel good. So, let's alter things to make me feel better. So, it's my will be done. My kingdom come. That's the mantra. It's not about your will be done or your kingdom come. Like I told you, I'm not being judgmental. If anything, as Paul, I feel like a chief of sinners. I, I remember the first time I read this passage when Paul said, I'm the chief of sinner. I said, you know, Paul, if there's somewhere I can disagree with you, it's here. I can't be maybe the chief of sinner, but maybe I'm the second chief. Can I be second in command in terms of the chief of sinners? <laughs> Because um, this is, however, the state of affairs of our salvation today. Can you see where we used to be from being burned in the stake for believing in Christ to just march in and do what I want? Because there's no rules, there's no regulations, there's no... And if, if, there, any, if there is any rule, if there's anything that restrains, put it away. Because that's the generation we live in, generation E. It's all about I'm entitled. In other words, God, I created you. I know you created me, but now let's twist it on. I created you. I'm going to tell you what to do for me so that I can. That's where we are today. Um, unfortunately, that's the state of affairs from the facts that we are seeing around us. So let's go back to the last part of the message, which is a cry to return to scriptures. Why we need to go back to the scriptures in terms of salvation. Acts chapter 4 in verse 12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Can you say amen to that? No other name for mankind. 
It's not Buddha, it's not Krishna, it's not uh, uh, nationalism, it's not socialism, it's not communism, it's not as much as you might like the social democratic in Denmark, I'm sorry. It's not about finances, it's not about the religion, it's not Catholicism, it's not Methodist. It, there's no name given under heaven except one name, and that's Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I remember those days we used to be part of a denomination when I was growing up as a minister, and everybody had to apply for a card, a license, a minister's license, under this denomination called the Assemblies of God, and I was part of it. In the days when I was in Uganda, I was very, very high-ranking in this position. It was one of those top positions. And we used to have a joke among us, ourselves in the, among the ministers because this, the rank, the, the, the the demands were so high that we used to say, for all have sinned and fall short of the assemblies of God <laughs> because we couldn't keep up to their demands. <laughs> but the Bible says, all have false, all sin, fall short of the glory of God. Then we go on in Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the true gospel. Sin pays. It pays you a salary with a handsome bonus. And you don't want that salary. Amen. Therefore, it says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's why Jesus came. That is what salvation is all about, to be saved. And that's why Jesus also mentioned in John chapter 6 and verse 44, He said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I'll raise them up at the last day. Hallelujah. Friends, I want to say this to you, and listen to me carefully, please, because this is how your mindset and your mentality of even evangelizing will, 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 will work out. Nobody can come to Christ unless God draws them. It is, you might sit here today and think that I came here because, you know, yeah, of course you came here because I invited you. Better not come if you're not being invited because I can't have space. But you didn't find Christ. Uh, you might think that, oh, I found Christ. No, 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 you got it all wrong. It was Christ who found you. It was Christ who found you. Don't, don't, don't for one moment forget this. And when you have to reach out to somebody, sometimes you think, I'm going to preach the gospel and this person is going to be saved. You're going to, you can preach the gospel until your face turns blue unless the Holy Spirit touches somebody's heart and unless God draws them, you can preach from morning till night till the cow comes home. Nothing is going to happen. People may look like they may say a few statements just to make you happy and repeat a mantra, a special prayer that you've made to, to, to guarantee that now they are saved. Only God knows what's going on on the inside. But that's the truth. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the truth. That's the sober truth. So don't ever for one moment forget it is God who draws. And then he tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. Hallelujah. That's how we have been saved. It was by grace, through faith. Because of what Jesus did, God drew us, we responded. Glory be to God. But having said that, having said that, don't forget in Matthew 3 and verse 8, this is what John the Baptist said, even preparing for the way of Jesus. He said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Yes, there's nothing you and I can do to get saved. Nothing. But it doesn't mean we do nothing after that either. Are you with me? He said, produce fruit. Because the axe is already in the, in, the, in the root of the tree. And it's about to cut down all the trees that doesn't produce. So we're supposed to produce fruit. These are, these are Bible scriptures, you see. And that's why in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, very important passage, the person who keeps on sinning belongs to... Everybody is very quiet in the church today. <laughs> The person who keeps on sinning belongs to, according to the scriptures, this is not Ravi, don't, don't be upset with me. The person who keeps on sinning belongs to the devil. And the devil has sinned from the beginning, but the Son of God came to, this, but the Son of God came to, seek and save. 
destroy. No, he was in verse 3. Came to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. What is the Son of God came? Destroy the works of the devil. And that's what God wants to do. So in terms of salvation, yes, we bear fruit. Yes, Jesus came for one reason, destroy the works of the devil, because we don't want to keep on sinning. And that's why it says, I love this, John chapter 8 and verse 11, the woman, she is now caught in adultery. Right-handed, right-handed, she's caught in adultery. There's no discussion. She has to be stoned to death. That's what the law of Moses says. They dragged her, threw her at the feet of Jesus. It says, the law of Moses says, this woman is caught in adultery, but she's stoned to death. What do you say? He says, well, okay. Whoever has not sinned, cast the first stone. From the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stone and walked away. And Jesus was writing on the ground. I don't know what he was writing. There was no iPad in those days. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he wasn't searching Google for their, for their history. <laughs> and they left. And then Jesus said this to her. He says, where are you? Where are those accusers? She said, they're all gone. He says, there's no one to condemn she says, no. She said in John chapter 8, verse 11, she said, no, no one, sir. She said, neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. And then he says, go now and continue having a blessed, sinful life. <laughs> go now and I bless you in your adultery. Go now and I give you, have an anointed sin. <laughs> in some translation, it literally says, go and sin no more. That's what Jesus said. That's what salvation is about, you see. It's about the change in our lives. Hallelujah. And that's why in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus said, you've got to be victorious. God will give you the strength. You cannot do it by your strength. Like I've told you many times, Colin White used to tell me this, you think it's difficult to be a Christian? It's impossible. You're trying to do it by yourself. And that's why you need the help of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit will give you the strength to be able to be that Christian. Hallelujah. And another verse, it says in John chapter 5 and verse 5, and I'm going to close very soon. It says here, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. That is salvation. Salvation is about overcoming the world. Glory be to God. There is nothing we can do to earn it. Jesus did it all. It's a free gift. But having obtained it, go and sin no more. Not go and sin some more. When we fall into sin, we confess and we repent. Not to justify our sins or change the scriptures, God forbid. That's what's happening today in our, in our evolution of salvation. Our, doctrinal, our doctrine of salvation, it will determine our Christian lifestyle, the way you believe in salvation. If salvation is cheap, it is, it's careless, it will just give you a carefree life. But if your salvation is like you realize that, hey, God has done something for me, and then you'll end up working out your salvation with fear and trembling. You see the difference? You see the difference? And that's why uh, this is what the Bible means by being in the world, but not of the world. Hallelujah. Now, I'm in conclusion. Can you look at the people sitting very far away from you and give them a thumbs up? Because I know you're waiting for this moment. <laughs> for those of you who haven't been in church for a long time, you're pretty, pretty excited being in. How many of you are happy being in, in a live church today besides just watching us being? Amen. <laughs> I know for you, thank you also for those of you who are on the screen. I know in, in times past, I was always looking at you, so do bear with me as I'm looking also at these live people. In a, I pray that you too are being blessed. Um, thank God for that. So, conclusion. Are you ready? All right, now, first of all, in the history of Judaism as well as Christianity, there has been dark ages. Let's, let's face the facts. None of perfect, not the denominations, not the theology. Theology is man's understanding. Theos is God in Hebrew. Logi is the word logic. So that's where we get the English word theology, which is basically theos logi, the logic of God. That's man's interpretation. Doctrine or dogma is what God's word is. That's irrefutable. It's, it's line against line, uh, verse against verse, precept against precept, concept against concept in the Word of God. You measure the Word of God not just in terms of its, uh, its text, but in context of what is written. But doctrine, uh, that's doctrine. Theology is man's. It's never one of them has been perfect. Everyone has their own issues. That's an old, old saying. 
all right, about what is important and not important. I, I like this, but try to listen to this a little bit and then see if you can digest this. In essentials, unity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Isn't that beautiful? In essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. At the same time, I have a saying, I want to tell you, I repeat this quite often, true liberty, by the way, is being liberated. Christ came to set us free. That's true liberty. True liberty is being liberated without becoming a liberal. A liberal means everything goes. Are you with me? That's true liberty. Now, it costs God just a breath to bring forth creation, but it cost him his blood to redeem it. It was costly. My friends, salvation was, was, was costly. It was not cheap. And likewise, in Christianity, we must understand that when we come to Christ, it is, it, 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 it's free, but it's not cheap. And that's why sometimes we say in business, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Have you ever heard that before? So you can't come to Christ thinking that, hey, this isn't something cheap. I'm just going to come you know, and, and just get, get it's, it's, it's expensive. Hallelujah. And Christ paid his blood. When Jesus inspected the seven churches in the book of Revelation, uh, he commented their achievements, but he also condemned their heresies. There were heresies in the church too. All kinds of heresies from Gnosticism to immorality, and Jesus was very, very specific about it. That's why we must embrace what we call the full gospel, not just half the gospel. Uh, that's, the, the, that's where it went so wrong in the time of... Uh, of Constantinople when he decided that now Christianity is part of the Roman Empire. It wasn't the full gospel. It was half the gospel. They took half of the gospel. They wanted the sign of the Christ and they took all paganistic beliefs. They mingled the two together. It was disaster for the, for the church. That's what we call the dark ages, unfortunately. How long will we gravel in the feet of false religion? We can't. We can't do that. Amen? So I'll just close... Uh, uh, sharing two uh, verses, two passages of, of, of uh, Bible scriptures, and then we will, we will end there. Back home, we have been reading uh, during this COVID um, period. My family and I, every single night, we read a chapter from the Bible. We've completed the book of Proverbs. We've done some of the Gospels. We've done James and uh, some Psalms. And recently, we were doing the book of Colossians. It was so refreshing. We've completed that now. I'm going on to some of the books. But... Um, I recommend to you to do that, to spend time. I remember talking to Anayo, and he said that during this time where they've been doing uh, Bible studies at home and reading together, he said that he was just shocked at the level of his children's uh, knowledge of the Word of God, and when they started to expound in the Word of God. Amen? So you're thankful for that. I've also been thankful to God uh, when I hear my, my boys uh, pray uh, in the evenings. We all pray. We take times to pray. And when my, I've been this two months or so, hearing them pray every single night for different things. I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, my sons are actually saved. You know, I was like, thank you, Jesus. They, they're <laughs> no, no, I'm saying this because sometimes some people think that just because you're a pastor, uh, your sons will, will, will make it. I'm sorry. I can preach the gospel to them, but they got to get uh, their own private relationship with God. They, they can't go to heaven and say that, I've arrived here, you know, I'm the son of Ravi. And Jesus will say, who, 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 what? You know, o- o- only, only the sons, <laughs> who is Ravi? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. When they get to heaven, they got to know that, Jesus, I know you personally. I don't get that because, you know, Ravi is my father. Ravi can be your father or your grandfather or your best father. It makes no difference. So each one of us have to have a personal relationship with the Lord. Amen? We read this last passage of Scripture, then we close. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. It says here, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world. Remember, the world also has spiritual forces. It's elemental. It is not biblical. It's not godly. Why? As though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch these rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on human commands and human teachings. There are a lot of uh, rules that have to do with human uh, commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom 
with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and the harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. How do I know I have the true gospel? The truth sets me free. It gives me freedom and victory over the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. It gives me liberty, gives me strength. And I can say that, thank you, God, because without you, I struggled. But with you, yes, I'm a victor. You see the difference? So we end with this last passage, uh, also Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. It's a beautiful passage where Paul in prison is writing and he tells the Colossians, look up to heaven, look up to God, be like a Christian. And he says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Amen? I feel like since 2019, maybe not now, you know, ever since I've been a Christian, something happened in, in, in my heart, in this church, you know, I, I suppose in the world. Since 2019, I can almost repeat this verse, and I said, yes, that was the year I died. Now I'm living for Christ 100%. Maybe prior to that, I was living for Christ, but I can see the old man always Rising up and rising up. I'm not saying the old man is dead now, but trust me, he's way under control. Something happened. Glory be to God from 2019. And then he says here, when Christ, who is your life, appears, glory be to God, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your inner earthly nature. Now, putting to death is a violent thing. It was a very violent thing. And, and, and in the times of the Romans where Paul even wrote this, it was very common for them to see people being put to death. And Paul says, put to death. What do you put to death? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You see, that's salvation. Salvation is not that we're going to be saved forever. Wrath is coming. I need to be snatched out of fire. Does that make any sense now? You used to walk like in these ways in your life. You once lived. Paul is saying, look, we all used to be like that, but that, is, that should be B.A. before Christ, or B.C., <laughs> before Christ. That should be before Christ, not after Christ. But now you must walk, also rid yourself of all such things as this, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Christians, this doesn't belong to us. Stop it. If you find yourself in this situation, stop it. You can say, but I can't help it, I'm angry. Go to God and say, help me, God. When you make a mess out uh, of your anger with somebody, go back and say, I'm so sorry. I don't want to be like this, but I'm working on it. Are you with me? Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with his practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and in the image of its creator. Lying is a language of the devil. Christians, there's no room for lying in us. Amen? Don't lie. Every time you lie, just remember that you're speaking the devil's ancient language. Glory be to God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So Christians should speak the? Oh, two of you are one speaking the truth. Christians <laughs> should speak the? Truth, amen, we speak the truth. Even when it hurts, by the way, sometimes it hurts to speak the truth. But you just speak the truth. Here, there is no Gentile, look at this, no Gentile, no or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ in all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, to see, God loves us. Clothe yourself with compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Glory be to God. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If you have, if any of you has grievance against someone, amen? If you have grievance against someone, forgive them. If I have grievance against you, I should forgive you. If you have grievance against me, you should forgive me. Amen? Will you forgive me? <laughs> amen? We should forgive each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And, all, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in all things charity, uh, in perfect unity. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns. Oh God, I, I miss hymns. And songs from the Spirit. Glory. You see, songs from the Spirit is Christocentric songs. There's a massive difference between a song that's, that glorifies God. Sometimes you sing some songs and you're like, you, 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 you just feel that your spirit is touching the Spirit of God because it's Christocentric. Are you, are you, because there are also many what we call humo, uh, humanistic songs as well. Humanistic is all about me, me, me. I feel bad. I feel lousy. I feel. But there's also songs about Christ. You are great. You are wonderful. You are amazing. You see the difference? So, uh, so that's the song of the Spirit. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through Him. Amen. And so this message, you ask yourself, why are you sharing a message about salvation, Ravi? Because th- let me tell you why, uh, and Lillian is going to come and pray. Um, you see, your, your understanding of salvation is going to determine the way you relate with Christ, the way you relate with the Bible, the way you relate with the church, the expectations you have, what God should do. Or, or, or how the Bible should, should have an impact on me, or what the church should do to me. All of this is, is the way your expectation is. If you've got the wrong doctrine of salvation, you'll be sitting around waiting for the church to come and save you. Trust me, the church can't save you. It's only Christ that can save you. Amen. Amen. Church can't save you. On that day, it's going to be not, uh, you can say, you know, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name, I did that in your name. You said, I don't know you. I need to, I only know, I know you. You know, it's not, it's not the church, it's not the science, it's not the wonders, it's a relationship with Christ. Only those who know Him, and that's how even Paul prayed, that I might know you. And I really believe, especially in these last days, we need to have our doctrine of salvation in the right place. It is not a, that's why I don't believe in, you know, sometimes some churches say, oh, why don't you just send out a bus and go collect everybody from all around the far corners and bring them to church? Look, you, you can do that if you want to. But in my opinion, if you belong to God, you come seeking God. It's not God coming after you all the time. He's made a way. And then you respond. Are you with me? There's a big difference between, yeah, we need pastoral care. All of us need that. But there's a massive difference. Pastoral care is for the sheep. It's not for, the, for those who, who need to seek. There's a massive difference between seeking God and not seeking God. And that happens when we pray. When we pray and we believe that God is uh, doing a work in the hearts of people, people draw to Him. And when you come to Him, it is not, I just come and then now all of a sudden God is just supposed to do everything for me. God brought them to the promised land. Prior to that, He said, oh, you haven't get, got there yet. I'll give you manna, I'll give you water. But the moment they got to the promised land, you know what happened? No manna. Nothing. They had to dig wells. They had to plant just like anybody else. So there's a season for, for the way God will babysit us. But when that season is over, we have to grow up, and that's the way it is with salvation. We don't, we're not just born again. We grow again, and we continue to become young men and young women and old men and old women in the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen? So I just pray to you that, uh, pray with you, that uh, our salvation will be a better understanding and not a, a, a false uh, understanding. The true gospel is that there is a price that Jesus paid and there is expectation from us. It's by faith. Um, and that's why the, the, um, the Armenians and the Arminism and, and Calvinism has always been arguing. As a matter of fact, both of them has a, have, a, have a, an understanding, one aspect of the understanding. It is not just by faith. Of course, it needs works. In fact, Martin Luther wanted to get rid of the book of James because he didn't like it. But it's not only by faith, uh, by works. Otherwise, why did Christ die? We have been saved by faith. But there are things we're supposed to do as well in order to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Amen? Praise God. So if you can stand with me, also those of you at home, if you want to, you're very much welcome to stand. And then we have a word of prayer, and Lillian will come and take over. Amen? Have you been blessed? Yes. You sure? Yes. Are you saved? Yes. Oh my goodness, if you're my leaders and you're not saved, we need to have a talk. <laughs> Today I just uh, wanted to address you as my uh, leaders and uh, just thank God for that. Let's just have a word of prayer before we uh, go to the rest of the service. Amen.
Um, I'll just prefer. I, I wish I can come there and kind of lay hands on you. I can't do that. But I'm just going to ask you to join me by just kind of laying hands on yourself, if that's okay. Because that will represent me coming and kind of laying hands on you. And so I'm just going to ask the Lord to touch you. Father, I just want to pray for not only those watching online uh, here in Denmark and around the world, those uh, brothers and sisters that are right here in the congregation, we pray for ourselves, Lord, because we have a heart. Your word says that our heart is really wicked uh, above all things and that uh, it has such a way of bringing deception into our lives. As a result of that, our minds can be so easily um, deceived by the wicked condition of our heart. But at the same time, you also said you give us a new heart, a heart of flesh, because of your love. You were upset for a long, long time with Israel, but then you said because of your unfailing love, you decided, Lord, to, to reach out to them, your love which is new every morning, your steadfast love, your unfailing love. And I know you have that same covenant that you made with us, Jesus, when you broke the bread and you, you shared the, the cup. That's a covenant of love. You said, I'm, I'm doing this for you. And I know, Lord, that you not just want to save us, but you want us to reflect you wherever we go. And there are struggles that are in our life. So as we lay hands on ourselves, I pray for those watching online, those that are live here, that you'll do something in our hearts and lives to bring, you, bring us even closer to you, whatever obstacles that are there in our lives, be it the lusts of the flesh or the lust of the eye, the pride of life, or just the deceptiveness of the devil or the deceptiveness of, of the world. Take it away so that we can come closer to you. We treasure our salvation. And Father, we just want to mention this, that we were so thankful that it cost so much for you to save us. Help us, please, not to treat it cheaply or trample over it, but to be holding it with a, with a precious heart, knowing that it's so much we, 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 we have received. We want to serve you. We want to be your servants. We want to live our lives, Lord, in obedience to your word. Help us, Lord, take away anything that obstructs, obstructs, that's an obstacle and obstructs us from coming closer to you, that we can come closer to you and be able to serve you. Hallelujah. For that, Lord, we praise you and we thank you and we ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Give you one assignment before you're seated. When you go home, try to read the entire book of Hosea. Is a, is a, is a, he's a beautiful prophet that God called to do some of the most insane things in order for him to express how much he loved Israel, Ephraim in this case, the northern territories, and how they turned their back on him. And in spite of that, God continued to love them. The book of Hosea, I know you have many, many things to read and many, many things to watch, but if you can do that, read the book of Hosea in a, in a language you understand, by the way, so that it makes sense. And I trust me, you're going to be touched in your heart. Read the book of Hosea. Amen? Thank you so much. My wife Lillian is going to come right now and be able to continue. There you go. Thank you, Ravi. Please be seated. Somewhere during Ravi's preaching, he said, okay, conclusion. I thought, wow, it's going to be a short message. And then Prince <laughs> bent over and tell me he's halfway through, mother. <laughs> so this boy knows his father. <laughs> But we are thankful he's been cooking all week and waiting to serve you um, this message. So we thank God for that. Um, currently, I'm following through the Bible. The Daily Bread provides us this possibility. You can read through the Bible uh, by following the schedule. And it's been, I've been so blessed. And as um, in line with Ravi sharing, if you read about the children of Israel, it sounds like a, a fairy tale when Moses commissioned Joshua to take over, you know, and blessings if you obey, curse if you disobey, and you would think everything would have ended there, right? Fairy tale story, it didn't. Then they went on to the kings and to the judges and so on and so forth. And then come Jesus, the Messiah. You are talking about the 12 disciples. Who else do you want to spend your life? Jesus, the 12 disciples. And out of the 12, guess what? There's a Judas. We're reading the scripture together and and it's a reflection time we thought. Think about it. Judas Iscariot spending this time with Jesus, the Son of God. But it never changed Judas. Judas remained Judas to the end. You know what I'm saying? Food for thought. And uh, then comes Jesus going to the cross. 
um, his death burial, we just celebrated the ascension. Jesus ascended, and then before he went, he, he commissioned them to wait here until the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will empower you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. Sounds like fairy tale, doesn't it? It didn't. And it goes on, and as Ravi shared church history, and there's a thread here. God entrusted responsibility to men and women like you and I. Men and women have failed along the way because they are men and they are women. They are human. But God never. Yeah, what Jesus did on the cross remained in the Father's plan and it will continue. And I'm reminded of uh, the story of Elijah and it, it touched me a lot um, recently in this Bible reading about Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14 and then verse 18. I would like to read this verse, not further preach, but to reiterate a point. In verse 14, um, God was asked Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah was discouraged after all the great exploit. And he said, I've been zealous for you, Lord. 1 Kings 19, 14, he says, I've been zealous for you, Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. Torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now, even me, they are trying to kill me. Yeah, that was how he felt. People have taken God for granted and they, you know. And God uh, told Elijah in verse 18, No, Elijah, perspective. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. Or whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouth have not kissed him. There are 7,000 that I have reserved. So it's not all gloomy. Through church history, so reflection, there's a group of men and women whom God has commissioned, God has entrusted with that responsibility to be his witness, to be his messengers, to be his lighthouse. They have failed God by their life, by their example. But God has also reserved, set aside. So which camp do you want to be? This group, not this group, 7,000 prophets who have not bowed down, who have not compromised. Which camp do you want to belong? Yeah? It's gloomy as we look at the world right now. It's gloomy. You feel that you are the only one at your workplace. You're the only one in your home. You feel like you are the only one. But God is reminding you, you are not. You are not the only one in that block. You are not. I have 7,000 other men with you, witnesses around you. But you, on your own, stand firm. Do not compromise. Do not bow down. Amen? So this is the reminder to all of us. It's not, not all gloomy. Yes, people have compromised. People have adulterated. People have diluted the message. But remember God's will. Keep your eyes on Him. He's your Father. He's my Father. And He's coming back. Amen? He's coming back for a church. So that's what we have to remember. Yep, thank you for the message and I pray that you will be able to reflect on it. Thank God for technology. You can listen to this message again in the comfort of your home later on when you return. I would like to go on to the next um, part of the service, which is the announcement. Uh, we have worshipped God with... Um, praises worship, listening to His Word, and now it's time we are going to collect tithes and offering. So this is the first time I'm going to do it with live congregation here, so you will have to bear with me because we also have an online congregation. We have three ways of giving through credit card. Uh, shortly, Uf is going to play a little video on this credit card, or maybe he can start doing it. Um, another way of worship is through mobile pay. Credit card offering in ICC is easy. Go to the address bit.ly slash ICC offering in your browser and you will see this page. First, you choose the amount you want to pay. Secondly, you choose the designation. You can write your CPR number, ICC account number or full name. You can write a comment if you want that and then you click next. Then you are asked for your first name, your last name, and your email address. And then you click Next, 
and you put in your card number and all the other details, the same way as if you were just shopping on Amazon.com. Lastly, you press the green button to confirm. After a few seconds, you will be taken to this page where it says thank you very much. This could not be easier. And always, if you have any questions, please contact us on info at getintouch.dk. Yes. Thank you for your giving. And we'd like to go on to the next slide that talk about the mission receiver. We are supporting Joshua, um, who's in Accra, Ghana, Esra in Kota, Kinabalu, East Malaysia, Kara and Darina in Prague. As um, we'd like to remind, yeah, I remember we make this announcement, Kara and Darina have just lost their daughter-in-law uh, during the COVID-19, not through COVID-19, but uh, she, um, she suffered from a very aggressive cancer. So in a matter of two weeks within, yeah, she uh, passed away at the age of 43. So the, pa the family is really going through grieving, especially the son. Um, and she left behind a very young, 13-year-old uh, son. So both Thomas and Christoph is in shock and trying to recover. And the whole family are coming together. So please remember Kara and Dorina in prayer. They're part of our missionary that God will help them to pull through this critical time. Um, we want to thank God for Arasu, back to the missions. Um, Arasu, during this COVID period, he's um, found this ice cream um, wagon, you know, and he has such a burden. He was a missionary in Uganda and then got married to a Dutch girl settled in Holland as a lay person, but his burden has always been back in Uganda. So what he's doing is he found this uh, ice cream wagon and he's selling ice cream you know, and raising funds to continue to build. I think uh, he has some more new vision that he has that he has shared with Ravi to build schools. He himself was uneducated and his burden is always to build school to help these children back in the village. Um, so that's what RSU is doing. And so this is what ICC wants to do. We want to help men and women who are doing the job enable them, empower them. Yes, so RSU is one of those. And David Zadok in Jerusalem, the first Messianic Jewish congregation continue to pray for him. It's not easy ground, but we thank God. So here are the missionary. ICC, be faithful with your missions giving so that we can continue to empower our brothers and sisters who are there. Thank you, Mark. Next, online forms and uh, information. Yes, our mission pledge, prayer, fasting, membership, and all that. So please sign up at www.getintouch.dk. You can have access to all this information. Um, and the next slide says midweek. I think Ravi, Ravi will explain more later on. We have come to the end of um, one module of our teaching. We have just covered the fivefold ministry. And uh, I believe those are online and you can follow us. But we would like to take a little break from this coming Wednesday onwards so there will be no live streaming. But instead, there will be a prayer meeting. And attendance is strictly by invitation and Ravi will explain a bit more later on. It will be from 6 to 7 right here in this hall. Next, yeah, next Sunday is 31st of May. We are going to have live streaming, continue and attendance still by invitation. Next Sunday is Pentecost, 50 days. And Pentecost have a very special meaning for Ravi and I. 18 years ago on the day of Pentecost, we say goodbye to the Pentecostal church and uh, we ended the chapter in our life in Denmark, which was, yeah, it was irony. We said, yeah, on the day of Pentecost, he preached the most Pentecostal message and we say goodbye, but it was a necessary chapter. Had we not ended that chapter, there will be no ICC, put it that way. And uh, interesting enough, the following week, we were originally planning, right, the first week of June to celebrate ICC's 18th um, birthday. Yeah, so we literally ended a chapter. It was, it was a chapter, and we thank God for that chapter, but uh, we opened this new chapter. So Pentecost always have a yeah, sweet and sour <laughs> uh, time for us, but we believe um, next Sunday is going to be great. Yeah, we believe significantly a new chapter that God is going to open for us. Amen? So Pentecost, going back to the Bible, was where Jesus told his disciples, tarry and wait because you shall receive the Holy Spirit and the empowerment will come upon you. And for what purpose? For you to be more powerful? 
more popular, more influential? No. That you will be my witnesses. Amen. So come next week online and for those of us, and I believe significantly God is going to do something. Amen. Now we come to the end of my announcement. It says, stay in touch. Sign up and share. Like and share. Watch and share. And especially during this time, we are going to pass on a lot of information because things are changing so quickly by the days. You know, it's not just weeks. So please sign up so that you can be kept informed of the development. And those who are online, bear with us. Our desire, our prayer, our wish is that we can all be together again. But for now, um, this is the best we can do. And we pray that you will remain steadfast in your faith towards God. Um, I just received a message from Gary. And uh, Gary, remember those exchange students who were here with us? And he told me we have graduated and they have secured a job. And they said for, for, for a lot of these Christians in Singapore who are used to big churches, you know, and uh, cell group meetings, all this external stimulation are taken away during this lockdown, you know, and it's really boiled out to your relationship with Christ. Who am I? A lot of them live with non-Christian parents and family, and you have to live together in this how many square meter apartment, and it's really who am I? It boils down to that. Am I still a Christian? You know, when all the external sti stimulation is removed, all the gatherings are gone, who am I? It's between Jesus and me. Am I still a believer? Will I still go to church? He said it's a discipline to chew on on the Sunday to, to worship God, you know. Yes, so I just want to encourage you, those who are online, press on. It won't be very long. Soon and very soon, we're going to meet again. Amen? I'll pass on to Ravi, who will come and close in prayer. Well, thanks Lillian, and thank you all, both online and those of you who are here live in Denmark, as well as those of you joining us from overseas, and uh, those of you who know, remember Torben and Eureka? Even when I was sitting down there, Torben sent me a WhatsApp message, and he says, thank you so much for the message. So you see, it's wonderful to be a blessing. It's all the way in Spain, and then here we are sitting down, and uh, of course the others, you know, I haven't yet followed online, but... Thank God, thank God, thank God. I still remember some years ago when we first started doing this recording and online, you know, thingy, uh, not many probably fully understood. Some maybe even know, were probably against it, thinking why should we do all of this? But trust me, during this period of COVID, uh, it, it was really a, a blessing. Yeah, and also sometimes I really feel bad about uh, Ulf because I really put a lot of pressure on Ulf, poor man. I mean, thank, he, he has the ability to take pressures uh, because I'm, I'm really, really... <laughs> and only lose his hair because I'm, you know, um, I, I know it's not, it's not a, a blessing to be a perfectionist in some way, but I like things to be, you know, uh, in some order because I believe that we're doing it for the Lord and I really want us to do the best and just with one camera is insane what we're able to do. But uh, sometimes I just thank God for his uh, ability to cope with my high and heavy demands. <laughs> <laughs> and still, we were able to put up all these things together. Thank God. Amen. Now I'm going to just pray the prayer of Brendan benediction over you. Receive the blessings. After which uh, we will close in a word of uh, as we close in a word of prayer. But uh, next Sunday is Pentecostal Sunday, and I'm pretty sure that you're going to be blessed um, by coming, joining us online, and and so on. Amen. And uh, we just have a blessings, and you may, those of you at, in the church, stand with me, and those of you in the congregation, you're also very much welcome to stand. Just receive the blessings of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you, and the Lord make His face shine upon you, and the Lord lift up His countenance and give you peace. Shalom. Shalom and shalom. Amen.